there's a lot going for us. Solar, wind, and batteries is the cheapest form of electricity in many places around the world. And that is likely only going to increase as these technologies scale. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing world changers in the creative, social impact, and vegan spaces. If you like what you hear on this episode, you're going to want to check out the bonus mini episode that you can access if you DM me at Isolde T on Instagram and you let me know you want it. You'll get access to bonus episodes, new art, my latest writing, and other fun benefits. And now, let's get to the show. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super honored that you've taken the time to be here with me and my guest today. Check this out. You know how close this is going to be to my heart once you meet this wonderful person. Zach Stein is one of the founders of Carbon Collective, the online investment platform built around solving climate change. Built with his oldest childhood friend, Carbon Collective constructs and manages portfolios that mitigate climate risk while maximizing impact for all the same fees and risk slash reward you would pay for generic index-based online investing. How cool is that? This is an entirely sort of untapped uh, way of doing things in my mind. So I'm super excited to have you here, Zach. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Isolda. I really look forward to chatting today. I, I'm so, first of all, I want to I want to go back to the beginning because this is so exciting for me and I'm I, I want to know so much more. But let's start at the very beginning. What is sustainable investing? What does that mean? That is such a good place to start because this is part of why we started Carbon Collective because the definition of sustainable investing that Wall Street and um, kind of the the bigwigs have put out there doesn't really make sense when we look Mm. especially at climate change. Mm -hmm. So to us, climate change is the challenge of our time. And if a something is not aligned with solving climate change, it's really hard to say it's sustainable, especially environmentally sustainable. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to investing, it's really clear what we have to do in solving climate change. Over the next 30 years, we need to dramatically wind down investments in fossil fuels and related mm-hmm. industries, mm-hmm. while dramatically winding up investments in climate solutions. It, if we don't do that, It doesn't matter how many trees we plant. It doesn't matter how much carbon we suck out of the sky with direct air capture. We just will not be able to be on a path to avoiding catastrophic change. Mm -hmm. So those are the table stakes. And so to us, for an investment portfolio to be sustainable, uh, it needs to align with that reality. And that's why we started Carbon Collective, because we didn't see anything that was frankly remotely close to that. That's really fascinating. And I'm super excited to delve in a little bit more. The thing that I'm the thing that I'm sort of really curious about, though, is something drew you to this some kind of change? What happened? Because it's not something that's in our consciousness. When we're children, what happened in your life that made you go? This is important enough for me to dedicate my career to it? Totally. So I've had a very interesting career. Um, Going back to, uh, as you said in the intro, my co-founder and I have have known each other since we were four years old. I have many memories of us. We grew up in kind of a rural area of tromping through the woods together, playing outside. So I think we had that deep connection of nature from the start. He had one of the most fascinating childhoods I've ever heard of is when he was 10, his parents sold their house and bought a sailboat. And he ended up sailing around the world from ages 10 to 15, being homeschooled. Wow. And like literally learning about the Greek myths in Greece. Amazing. Things like that. Really cool. Um, Both of us post-college started on these different paths down sustainability. Mine was in urban agriculture um, and food justice. And his was in alternative forms of energy. Um, And for us our this is our second startup our first was trying to help an industry that is traditionally quite unsustainable have much better monitoring so it could be far more efficient with its resources Mm -hmm. but for me it was really in 2018 with the ipcc report that came out where up until that point climate you know 
drove a Prius, did, did, did all the things. It didn't feel like it was the issue of our time. It felt like maybe it was the issue of the next generation. Mm. And that plus, is, plus I live in the Bay Area, uh, having annual wildfires, having wildfire season really come out of nowhere. It, I grew up in the Bay Area. It was not a thing. And it's now totally a thing. Mm -hmm. And seeing that change in my lifetime and showing, wow, this is what it's already like. Um, that was kind of, I, I had a friend uh, who said that the climate anvil hit him on the head, like mm -hmm. Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of my anvil there. It's a little bit of a violent metaphor, but I also kind of like it. Um, and so that's what set us to say, okay, for our next company, we wanted to look and we started just really open and see how could we build better tools that could enable individuals to collectivize their climate impact and, maxim and to maximize that impact. And so we ended up uh, interviewing 120 of our peers, both in our network and beyond, to understand what actions their climate anxiety had taken them to take and where they got blocked. And again and again, we saw people were trying to change their investments because there's this sense that when you're investing, you're building and you're a part of something bigger than yourself. And so people were trying to say, I want to align my investments with the world that I actually want to retire into. But again and again, they couldn't find something that made sense to them in that regard. So for us, we knew we wanted to build something where first off, it was a smart investment because your 401k is not charity. But then once we cross that bridge, made would drive as much climate impact in as clear a way as possible with as clear a theory of change as we could so that's where we landed oh that's fabulous i love that answer and and the reason is because when i look at and it is the issue of our times it's been sort of almost a glacial awareness and using glacial in a in in both its sentence in senses here it's been a slow awareness many people there are some people who who've been trumpeting about it for decades now you know that the mean average temperature mean average temperature i worked at nasa for many years the mean average temperature in the last 50 years has skyrocketed and we need to do something about it and there are some people who are like no 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 this is just a natural event and we don't have to do a thing because we don't impact it at all so now we have of companies and organizations that have have uh, startups that are that are that are evolving or really working on some of these big huge issues and how how do we identify them and is that something that carbon collective is trying to do identifying those companies and those organizations and seeing i guess which ones are viable for investment and if so how do you know how do you how do you generalize gen, generalize generate all of that information and and how would someone figure that out and do that kind of investing it's, it's a lot of questions question. i know <laughs> no no i think it's maybe the place to start is if you aren't kind of deep in climate in the way that we are it can feel really overwhelming mm -hmm. To get in and this is part of why we wanted to offer that simplification and with that of saying if it's not dramatically winding down investments in fossil fuels and related industries and dramatically winding up investments in climate solutions it's probably hard it's hard to say it's sustainable but let's go a level deeper than that there are fortunately some really great resources and plans of exactly what we need to do to solve climate change um, these are independent groups, either nonprofits or think tanks that have uh, like literally hundreds of academics and engineers and scientists coming together, mapping that route to say, okay, what is the most realistic path to getting here? And it's not a return to like pre-industrial times. That's just not going to happen. People aren't going to give up their air conditioning. Uh, it is how do we build a world that has the same luxuries that we have today, but is running without burning stuff. Because right. That's the real problem mm -hmm. of what we have here. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether that is switching to 100% renewable energy or electrifying our cars and our homes and our industry um, and you know changing the way that we do agriculture, there are um, literally hundreds of climate solutions that are being worked on and built. And so where we see Carbon Collective fitting into this is it is our it is not our job to say what is the climate solution. It's our job to say, okay, let's identify the experts 
who have said what, what, what is a climate solution and what isn't. And then let's go and apply that right now to the public stock markets. And how do we use that as much as possible? So in our climate solutions co collection, we look at every single publicly traded company that is building a solution to climate change. And again, this is broader than just solar and wind. It's batteries, it's uh, you know, uh, building automation um, and plant-based foods and so much more. Um, and then we say we remove those who are generating more revenue from products or services that are dependent upon or built for the fossil fuel industry. So we just use revenue. We aren't using commitments or anything like that because when it comes to climate, talk is still really cheap and <laughs> actions are what matter. For sure. It sounds like a multi-tiered approach though, too, if you're going, if you're going, or, or deeper approach, if you're going to look at, is this company, uh, you know, manufacturing lots of hydrocarbons that are going up into the atmosphere, that's okay, maybe they aren't, but are they getting resources from companies that are? So you're going back sort of further and further to make sure that the companies that you wanna recommend and work with are going to be down the line trying to be more sustainable. Is that correct? Tell me about that if that is the way it is. Yeah, that's broadly correct. Look, okay. the reality that we live in is the, our world is still run by fossil fuels. Right. And let's give them their due our civilization just would not exist without them. It, it, an incredible amount of energy um, that ha has been unleashed through burning them. Um, and I think in the climate community, we can so often demagogue and there's so much to demagogue, but it's also the reason that like I'm able to talk to you right now. Um, and so we try to take that level of pragmatism of say, okay, let's hold that and let's also hold the promised land of what is this world that again, we're not the ones who are in charge of uh, building. We are looking at the best plans that are laid out there and say, how do we translate that on today and then map that course to there? So I can maybe explain how we build our portfolios because I think that will build, that'll add a little bit more color to your question. I would love that because I, I'm so good. A, I'm like, sign me up. But B, I don't know enough about it. And I would probably get myself into a lot of trouble. So I would love to know a little bit more about because this is in I mean, you know, this is the Innovative Mindset podcast. So it, you've taken you you obviously have a mindset that's looking at a way of innovating, but doing it sustainably and also supporting companies and organizations with investments that are going to be sustainable. And again, you're singing my song. I'm just not sure how that process works when, as you said, our world is still, for the most part, run on fossil fuels. Exactly. Exactly. So what we start with is we look at the entire U.S. stock market. <clears throat> About 20% of it are sectors and industries that are technologically dependent upon fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So uh, for them to exist in the world that where we solve climate change, where we are not emitting carbon to run our civilizations into the atmosphere or other greenhouse gases, these com these uh, industries will either need to have a miraculous tech that is still like on the lab bench and incredibly unproven come out or get out of their industry entirely. So that's about 20% of the market. Examples, oil companies, coal companies, petrochemical, cement, steel. Um, some of these we really need to decarbonize, um, mm -hmm. like cement and steel. They probably aren't going anywhere, but right now the technology doesn't exist today. So we decarbonize from, or sorry, we um, divest from that 20% and we give its share to the companies that are building solutions to climate change. So this is what I described earlier. It's right now our 2022 collection is 169 stocks. And we are, we're trying to apply the smart index-based um, investing principles where we're not saying which solar stock is gonna win or lose. We include all of them, but just weight it by market cap. So we're trying to set these broad ethical parameters, but then let the market decide the rest of it. So that's that divest and then reinvest um, for that 20% of our core portfolios. And then the remaining 80% of the stock market, these are broadly the companies whose core business can exist without changing in the world where we solve climate change, where we are not emitting carbon to run our civilization. What that means then is it is upon us as shareholders in those companies to use our votes in that seat at the table to push them to get there as fast as possible. The example I often use is Coca-Cola. 
Mm -hmm. Coke is not an environmentally friendly company. They mm -hmm. have a, a historic mistreatment of their watersheds. They use a ton of plastic. Um, you know, they, they emit carbon from the creation of their sodas. At the same time, in that world that is carbon free, Coke can sell me a brown sugary bubbly beverage that uses the secret recipe. Um, it, that core business remains unchanged. What has changed is it's done so with 100% renewable energy delivered to me on a fleet that is 100% electrified or using green hydrogen, ideally um, protecting their watersheds instead of abusing them. That to us is where we should engage as shareholders. We see, and we have strong opinions on this, we see a lot of movement or a lot of excitement about going to fossil fuel companies and owning them and saying, hey, you need to change for those of us you know, who care a lot about climate. And we just, we think that it is inspiring, but also likely to be very ineffective to do that. It feels good. These are the enemy or David versus Goliath. Um, but even if you got ExxonMobil to commit to becoming 100% green, it's unlikely to have any real impact on climate because someone else will just buy those, those oil sites, those extraction sites and use them so long as there is demand for fossil fuels. And that's why to us, it's really important that we not worry about the supply of fossil fuels in our investing strategy, but how do we work with those who are, could most easily switch to decarbonizing themselves to do so to decrease demand as quickly as possible and leverage the fact that we are both shareholders and that companies like Coca-Cola see us as consumers. I really don't like that word, but it's useful in this context that uh, they spend literally billions of dollars a year trying to protect their brand's image in our eyes. So we have even more power there to put pressure on them to move faster on these issues. I'm taking all of that in, that's fabulous. Okay, how do I formulate this next question? It seems to me that Oh, I don't even know how to say this. So so it's almost like you want the companies that can make changes in this way to feel kind of the pressure to make changes in this way, right? By, by as you called it, consumer dollars and also people who are shareholders. So it's not invest in green and only green companies. It's invest in companies who could easily make the switch and then work from within to nudge them in that direction. Am I, is that is that correct? It's both. Okay. So we have we have two broad portfolio types okay. that we offer. Mm -hmm. One is the it, the all of it. So you're gonna over you're gonna divest from fossil fuels. You're gonna overweight the companies that are building climate solutions, and then broadly hold that remainder to pressure them. So that's divest, reinvest, engage. We also have our climate only portfolios because some folks are like, look. I get the theory of change here. I just really don't want to own Coca-Cola. So right. I'd, I'm willing to take a higher risk and higher reward because I know this is a less diversified portfolio and that's fine for me. So that's our climate only portfolio where all of your dollars are going to be into companies who are building a climate solution in, on the stock side. And then all of the bonds are green bonds. I'm so grateful for you, actually, honestly, Zach, because uh, I actually have tried to work with investment advisors who have said, you want to do what? No, I'm not going to work with you. That's too much work, right? F identifying those companies, because I only invest in things like solar and only invest in green companies, or I don't want to. But that, yes. that the, the problem then becomes something that I've heard called greenwashing. And that's a problem for me because you, you sort of think, well, I'd like it if you would give the explanation for what greenwashing is, because I'm sure you have a better handle on it than I do. But it just seems like it's a little bit of a, of a gaslighting situation. Like they, 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 they're just like, oh, no, 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 we really are green when maybe we're not. Can you talk about what greenwashing is a little and, and how it works and how does it help or hurt the environment? Absolutely. Um, a lot of people who come to work with us are exactly in your shoes that they're pissed off about greenwashing. It's a very real phenomenon and it makes sense. People are, you know, a lot of people, those who the, the climate anvil have hit and those maybe who it fell close by are really emotional about climate change. Fear mm -hmm. is really that main emotion. And when there is fear, there is an opportunity you know, people are spurred to action and some are going to look to capitalize on that emotional trend. Mm -hmm. And that is where greenwashing has come in. 
where greenwashing is most prevalent when a company makes a commitment that maybe sounds good, but it's either they overcomplicate it or it's really far out. So it doesn't actually lead to real action. And what it leads to is a reduction of pressure on it. It's a pressure release. So let me give a couple of examples. Please. JP Morgan Chase and the big banks have pledged to go net zero and divest um, uh, from fossil fuels by 2050 in their portfolios, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in who they loan to. That to us is greenwashing because it is not in line with what we need to do to solve climate change. We need to do that much faster. Mm -hmm. And frankly, those executives are going to be many decades retired by the time that that actually that commitment actually needs to come out. And so it is it is not tangible. There is no teeth to it. It is just a way of trying to make them make make us feel better about them. It is a way of brand protection. Um, we've seen this uh, also fossil fuel companies do this all the time. Um, trying to show that they are um, on the side of solving climate change. And uh, uh, BP right now is actually being sued about this. BP as an oil company is probably broadly seen as the most climate forward. And in 2019, they put together a massive ads campaign at the UK showing like, you know, how they were installing electric vehicle chargers and investing very heavily in renewables and other alternative low carbon fuels. Um, so this is, they're truly trying to change our perception of them as a company. Where greenwashing comes in is where that perception doesn't meet reality. And they're being sued right now because for every hundred pounds that BP currently spends in, in investing, um, 96 pounds are going into fo the fo their fossil fuel portions of their business. It's only 4% of their annual investment is going into low carbon or carbon free alternatives. And pound, so, by pounds, you mean pounds, pound sterling, the actual money, not pounds <laughs> of something, right? Just to You're clarify. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was confusing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no so worries. No worries. It, maybe percentages is an mm -hmm. easier way to think about it. Um, so okay. only 4% of their annual expenditure is going into that. And that's to us why we look at revenue because talk is really cheap in this. And there's so much money to be gained in the short term by making it seem like you're green and making it seem like you're allied and understand um, these, uh, these outcomes. I'll give one more example if that's Please. okay. Mm -hmm, of course. Uh, we're seeing companies get caught now in a really in, an increasingly untenable position. So BlackRock, is the largest asset holder in the world, something like $10 trillion. Mm -hmm. um, and they, be, largely because of pressure from activists, climate activists, um, their CEO, Larry Fink, I think it was in 2021 or maybe 2020, uh, came out and said in his annual letter that climate is an existential issue and that BlackRock and other investors need to factor it into their um, investing decisions. And that BlackRock was pledging to, again, reach net zero by 2050 and align its investments with that strategy. This was really big news. This was like a lot of folks in the divestment movement were like, finally, you get it. This is not just about like being green. This is actually a tangible risk for investment. The problem that BlackRock is now facing is that they, they're, you know, saying this and kind of going down this path of saying, all right, you know, we should be divesting from fossil fuels. But then uh, some of their asset holders, uh, in particular, the Texas uh, uh, Teachers Pension Fund said, whoa, 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 we really like fossil fuels. This is really important to our state and our industry. You got to cut this divestment talk or else we're going to find a different asset manager. And you actually have legislatures um, in a number of states now, uh, particularly red states, that are saying and looking to pass laws that say that uh, their pension funds cannot divest from fossil fuels. And so in response to that, BlackRock signed an open letter committing its long-term uh, commitment to the fossil fuel industry. Mm. Oh, that's tragic. So it is tragic. And so there's a, it, it, this again comes to, when it comes to climate change, it is both really complicated. And I think this is what you alluded to at the beginning of looking at it from the outside. You could be like, oh my God, I'm so overwhelmed. 
And at the same time, it's so simple. It's what we, I talked about. Fossil fuels have to go way down in investments, climate solutions way up. Um, and that's that world that they're caught in between. And these, these uh, especially Wall Street, where it is so invested in that old world. And so that's why for us in starting Carbon Collective, we're like, we think it has to be outsiders who are gonna come in and change this industry. I guess the thing is, though, that because your point is well taken, the, the individual can vote with their dollars, et, et cetera, et cetera. But, but what we're asking when we're talking about this is we're asking people to think long term about something that seems very short term. And for me, I use, as I said, I used to work at NASA doing environmental education. And so when I think about it, I go the difference between weather and climate, right? Weather is, is it going to rain today? Climate is, is where I live that's got lots of good trees going to become a desert because the climate heats up to such an extent over the long haul. So what is your strategy, if you have one, of educating your potential customers and even your, your current customers? customers and clients in thinking long term versus the short term of like the, the Texas Teachers Union going, no, 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 our state really likes oil. You, they're not thinking about, well, what about the day that oil runs out and we no longer have any of that resource? They're thinking right now it's good, but that's short term thinking. Do you have any thoughts on that? And if so, what are they? Absolutely. We do a lot of this. Um, so much of what we do at Carbon Collective and what we aspire to do is how do we tell this story in a way that's more accessible and rockable and hopefully inspiring. Did you there just quote is... Stranger in a Strange Land to me? I love Maybe. it. <laughs> that's great. More grokable. Sorry, but that was great. I just had to go, yay, Stranger. Go for it. Go for it. Sorry. <laughs> it's just such a good term. It is. Um, so lost my train of thought. Okay. Um, so much of when it comes to climate, and I think this is what you touched on, is fear. It's terrifying um, what could happen. And I think anyone who's been in this space, you go through this phase of really facing what we're on track for. Because what we're on track for right now is a three degree sea of warming world by 2100. And it is completely unlike the world that we have today. And that's mm -hmm. terrifying. Mm -hmm. What is not talked about enough, and this is what we really um, are working on pushing, is the incredible rewards on the other side of this. It is not just an aversion of pain. Um, the world in which we solve climate change is just a much better world than the one we have today. For sure. It is cleaner. It is safer. It is healthier. Um, we don't have the Putins of the world <laughs> being able to wield their fossil fuels. Right. Um, and lording it over an entire continent in what we're seeing today. Asthma rates have plummeted because we're just not burning stuff to fuel our civilizations. Do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic when all there's all that news about how clear all mm -hmm. those cities were around sure. the world? Sure, sure. That's what the world looks like where we solve climate change. It's a great example of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you so know, it's I interesting. Think... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I thought you were you done. Finish. Oh, I've just like looking at the urban heat island effect is a really good example of this is that when we're when everything is cement covered and lots of buildings and lots of cars and lots of hydrocarbons and other volatile organic materials going up into the atmosphere, things heat up faster. But again, that's one of those things where we have to understand it looking at it over time. And I don't know that we are a species that that knows how to do that because we live day to day. Yes, um, I'm not gonna remember the exact source. I should look it up. We should show it in the show notes. Um, there is a book that was really powerful for me. It was written by a planetary geologist, I believe was his title. And it was looking at climate change in particular, but kind of like from a, like a galactic scale. Mm. And one thing that really stuck with me is that uh, dominant species of which we are the dominant species on earth right now, they can have what he named as different levels of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And he uh, clarified, I don't think this is original to him, um, that we are, an right now as a species, we're an intelligence of a third kind, which means that we can realize that we're dominant. And we also can see that our dominance is leading towards an unsustainable future. It mm -hmm. is leading toward a future where we will no longer be able, be able to be dominant because we've too thrown off the natural order of our world. An intelligence of a, for, of a fourth kind, of which he argues it would be in any alien species that we interact with, 
would be an intelligence of a fourth kind in that they have crossed that chasm and they have understood how as a species do we interact sustainably with our planet um, and with our world that we've grown up on. So this is one of the most fascinating times to be alive. It is scary. And there's also so much hope um, of can we make that transition? And what gives me a lot of hope is that there's a lot going for us when it comes to climate. Um, and it's just, if we uh, strip away altruism and all of these factors, there's just things that, and in, in we base kind of the, the aspects of human nature that have been highlighted by our hyper-capitalistic, hyper-individualistic world. Um, th there's a lot going for us. Solar, wind, and batteries is the cheapest form of electricity in many places around the world. And that is likely only going to increase as these um, uh, technologies scale. Electric cars are just better cars. They are uh, faster, they can tow more, they, you can literally drive a Tesla for a million miles before you need to replace it. They cost way less in maintenance and pretty soon they're gonna cost less upfront than internal combustion engine cars. So we're just in the middle of this technological shift where yes, any legislation that comes is really gonna help that, but the just sheer market forces alone are really trending towards that switch. So there's more coming in at the same time, we have more and more people. This is what's really inspiring of being in the climate tech space of what we're being in. There is so much talent coming into this space. There's so much money that is coming into this space. The aha moment is, is very here right now. And so the, we're still walking on that tightrope, but it is really inspiring to see. And I think that that is part of, to go circle back all the way to your question of how do we tell this long-term story I think that we need to focus equally as much as we're talking about the problems, we need to talk about the solutions. I'll give one more example and then I'll um, pause. And uh, <laughs> Don't pause, this is awesome. Okay, I was having um, dinner with my cousin and, uh, and their family and they're, um, you know, he's like 20 years older than me and their kids are like 10 and seven. And they were talking about how they did a play about climate change at school. And, you know, this is like third graders. And each kid came on stage and was a different animal and said, I am the polar bear. I am the polar bear. My ice is shrinking. Who will save me? Who will save me? And then next, the sea otter, et cetera. And that's, the, that's only half of the equation. It should be, you know, I am the polar bear, and then I'm, I'm also the solar installer, you know, mm. and, and I'm installing solar because it's cheaper, it's a cheaper form of electricity. Um, that is the type of pairing that we need and the type of education that I think is really missing because there's that closing of the loop and it emotionally just leaves us in this place of extreme anxiety of saying, well, we're screwed. Right. And I don't know how I can plug into this. Um, so I'm just going to ignore it. And when I see the news about like more ice caps breaking off and stuff like that, I'm just going to keep my head down. And it's the don't look up phenomenon that mm -hmm. comes, which just makes a lot of sense psychologically. So we need solutions to come in and we need to bring those forth more. And so that's part of what we try to do at Carbon Collective as well. I love that. And, you know, never, never raise a problem without also raising potential solutions is, is a really good mindset to have, I think. The, the thing about it is, though, like when you're talking about these these places that are that are looking, the, these entrepreneurs and, and new companies, the people who are, it seems to me, the people who are coming out, you know, we're not all Elon Musk going, I'm going to make Tesla. They're small and they may also need uh, you know, an influx of cash or, or, or investors to, to help them with some of the more, not so much the, oh, we can switch, but really like I'm coming in and I want to do wind power or I'm coming in and I want to look at uh, permeable roads, right? Roads that are made out of a permeable material so that the water runoff isn't as bad, so we don't have as much soil erosion, blah, blah, blah. So if that's the case, uh, a company I imagine has to be publicly traded for you all to to know about it and to recommend investing in it is that the case I don't I don't know how all of that would work so I'm wondering for the smaller entrepreneur and the individual investor what role can they play and 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 what kind of an impact can they have if they're if they're tiny if they're one person or 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 one entrepreneur absolutely um, the 
at Carbon Collective right now, we only invest in public securities. So that's public mm -hmm. stocks and bonds. It's our starting place. We're very excited to bring in other alternative as assets like direct investments in solar farms and things like that into our portfolios as we grow. There are a lot of opportunities to invest uh, directly in those type of projects. There's different crowdsourcing platforms and things like that, which are increasingly really exciting. Um, I think I want to take a step back and talk broadly about um, two things. One is that exact phenomenon of, again, to solve climate change, we have to be investing far more in climate solutions. The numbers are really big. Um, it's somewhere between, according to the best estimates, we need to be investing five to nine trillion more dollars per year wow. in climate solutions. We, it, this is a problem that we have to build our way out of. We can, mm -hmm. the only way we transition is to do it. It's not gonna happen passively or through charity or just through governmental action. Um, we have to invest in it. So whether you're an entrepreneur who's saying, I wanna invest my time and my energy and my sweat and my tears into this, um, or you're you know, a friend of an entrepreneur who's saying like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you out um, with this, then absolutely. Uh, I think the other part here of what you touched on is this question of I'm one person. Climate change is a global problem. I was born into a world that was run by fossil fuels. It wasn't my choice to do it. What is what? What do I do? What is my responsibility within that system? And this is something that we heard a lot when we started Carbon Collective. Of there's one response to that question, which is basically like F you. It's all corporations and governments. Um, so like, I, you know, what am I supposed to do? I'm one person. And it's something I really sat with for a long time. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on this as well. Because I think that what that question begs is says, how does the world change? Because if it isn't the only way I've gotten to is it's when enough individuals take collectively the same action that the world starts to change. We've seen this with the rise of plant-based foods and meats and meat alternatives. If enough people didn't buy that when it was more expensive at the beginning, then the world wouldn't change. You wouldn't have that action and you wouldn't have kind of the plethora and the far more that are coming um, with that. So it's been, I, I still, I struggle with that question of where is an individual and I still get to, you have to act and it's an act of faith which I think is really challenging because you don't see the difference of when you choose to say bike to work or uh, you know not eat the hamburger of what that difference makes. And I talk about kind of the math there of this was pretty well explained by um, Will McCaskill and their group where I think for a lot of us, we think, okay, like if I'm not gonna eat a hamburger, I'm not gonna take a flight like the plane's still gonna fly or like the hamburger is still gonna be at the store. How does that actually have an impact? And what we don't think about is what is the, we're, we're just thinking about the likelihood of that having impact. And it's admittedly quite low, but we don't multiply that by the magnitude of what that impact could possibly be. And it's often in a step function. There is some point where if there's, there's if one fewer person flies on that route, they're gonna cancel that plane route or that grocery store is gonna order a, a thousand fewer hamburgers, which will then circulate up the supply chain um, that week. There's some crossover point and you just don't know if you're gonna be the one or not, or if you're just getting that one closer to it. So that's that active faith when I think it comes to, okay, what am I doing with my money or with my time in this? That it's a collective act of faith in building. And this goes to why I think it is so important for us to picture that long-term and not just the avoidance of climate change, but what we're building towards. Because we cannot collectively build anything unless we are collectively imagining it. And if we can't collectively imagining it, then it just, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that we can't get there. So that's why we have that pushback and so much on that, like, well, it's all corporation and government's fault because it stops the process of imagination. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that the status quo remains. I feel like if I had a mic to drop right now, I would drop the mic for you. That was brilliant. Yeah. No, seriously, because 
yeah, I, I'm right there with you, and and I and and yet I I actually would say that you can see a difference in yourself if you choose to bike to work. You can see a difference in yourself if you choose not to eat that hamburger. If you are aware, you can see not not necessarily maybe even how that one time that you ride to your bike to work changes the entire climate. I don't I don't know. I don't want to apply the butterfly effect to that. But what I want to say is you feel better, right? If you bike to work, your body moves more fluidly. If you don't eat a hamburger, your body's digestion is going to probably be a little bit better. I'm vegan and and proudly so. So I will talk about plant based and vegan stuff all day long. But I think that that, you know, what was that? Same. Yeah. All right. Woohoo. All right. We're on this. We're team vegan. Uh, But 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 the thing is, you to me, I think the microcosm in some ways relates to the macrocosm here. Like we can look at a choice to not eat this hamburger. Yes, the cow is already dead. That is true. But there, that may mean that one fewer cow dies next week. I don't know, but I would like to see that. I love cows. So so when we look at all of this stuff as, as how the individual can make a change, absolutely, there there is a way, I think, to do that. And at the same time, we are in we're in a place where we have to, like you said, build awareness. How do we do that? Right. We have to start thinking of. It's not that, oh, there's a lot of smog in L.A. It's that, oh, there's a lot of smog in L.A. And I noticed that. And what can I do about it. You may not come up with the solution that gets rid of smog that, you know, that that removes all of the, the hydrocarbons from the atmosphere. No, but you you can have power. And that goes back to that. Let's not tell that there's a problem without also going, here's our potential solution. And yet there are a lot of people out there who go, "Ooh, wait, it's somebody else's problem. It's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem. Someone else can do that social change. Somebody else, you know, that's the government. When you when you hear that, when when somebody talks to you about it or when you're talking to somebody and they go, no, 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 it's not my problem. It you know, the government deals with all of that stuff. I can't do a thing. What do you say to the person? What what is your response when when that kind of thing happens? Yeah, I try to dig in on how how much do they want the world to change? Okay. Um, and how much of this is a, you know, hey, just stop talking to me about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just kind of that reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, it gets into, and, and this is something that we think about a lot, because climate change is overwhelming. Um, and where, how do you build in the right reward structures into that? Because humans, we're driven by rewards. Like that's just, it's just how we operate to such a great degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we like to say to folks is, First, make sure that the major parts of your life are aligned with the world where we solve climate change. And what's nice about these is that they're largely decisions that you can pick up once, inspect really closely, and then put down. And you're just you're just living a cleaner life that's more aligned. So for example, how are you getting your electricity? If you you know happen to own a home where solar is viable, that can be a great way to do it. You can invest in a community of solar program. Um, You can also work with your utility to buy in in many, many more places, um, wind and um, solar with that. So you pick up that decision. It might be kind of hard. You wrestle with it. But then once you do it, it's done. It's not the question of do I bike to work today or not? It's not the question of, you know, should I turn my lights off or not? When you are using electricity, it's coming from cleaner sources. This is going to be the same with how you're transporting yourself. This is going to be the same with what you're doing with your money, where it's being banked, where it's being invested. To us, these are very much the uh, kind of the, the pillars that ever like everyone who is in the climate space and is caring about that, those who are coming into it and those around it should make sure that you're doing because life also needs to be lived. And I think it is unpragmatic to assume that everyone is going to be as passionate as the most passionate person. It's unpragmatic for me to assume that everyone's going to know as much about climate as me and be as passionate about it. And so therefore, it's my job of how do I frame and help with prioritization. So like I had a friend, this was a big moment for me, who she was looking to buy a new car. And in talking, she leased an electric car with me and she's really happy about it. 
And that to me was like, wow, that's 10 years of potential gas burning emissions that I helped avoid. Because when you make these one-time decisions, there's a lot of lock-in there. So I, I think that's a lot of the way that we think about it. Um, the other way I think as well is we look, we're, we're not going to win over 100% of people. There's just going to be people who are saying like, I'm not ready for this. And with that, you know, this, this is the innovation podcast. I find it helpful to think of like a classic adopters curve. So there's going to be those people who are going to adopt a technology. They're going to buy the electric car, even though it's a lot more expensive because they're like, this is awesome. They're going to As do that. Early adopters, you mean in that way? Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. And so it's for them, I think there's a process of self-identifying, of saying, am I an early adopter? Like, for example, my wife and I, we installed a heat pump in our house. It was more expensive than if we had gotten a gas furnace but it should save money over time. It also allowed us to have air conditioning in our house when we didn't have it before. That was me making a conscious act of saying, we are gonna be early adopters in this space because the more demand that we stimulate for heat pumps, the cheaper we're gonna make them. And we can set up other reasons to use them like the long-term benefits of them being much more energy efficient and thus costless come to fruition. Same thing with electric cars. They're still more expensive upfront today that is going to change. It's gonna change faster, the more demand that there is for electric cars. So I think it is that identification of saying, just what motivates me, let me try and get you on board with it. But if I can't, that's okay, because there could be other reasons too. If an impossible burger is a third of the cost of a hamburger, that could be pretty impactful. Um, in what we're going for. So I think that that that's a lot of the ways that I think about that and just try to place people where they are on that adoption curve. I think that's fabulous. And and you know, you can look at it, you can look at it from the perspective of I want to pay less and also I'm helping save a cow's life. Both of those things are to me equal, you know, they're well, they're not equally valid because I think it's to me it's more valid to save the cow's life. But I'm a, I'm vegan for the animals. So so we're talking about the individual here, and I think that's great, but I kind of want to veer a little bit away from that and talk about companies, right? What could a company do to to not just in their mission, but in the way they invest themselves? You know, you've you mentioned earlier something about green 401ks, which I can't wait to hear what those are about. What can a company that that wants to take care of their employees, but and and also have a profit, but also wants to be much more responsible as far as the climate and as far as some of these big earth shattering problems, if you will, what can they do and how can they approach it in a way that's sustainable and dare I say conservationist? Absolutely. Um, companies can do a lot. Companies are the way, it is the, the contemporary way that we largely organize individuals. To, to have a shared mission. And so uh, orienting a single company in a way that's more sustainable could be very impactful when it comes to climate. Again, there's a lot of room for individuals to pressure and do that. I like to say when I talk with a company or something that is looking to do this, I say, start by taking that same approach. What are the big one-time decisions that you get to pick up, do, and then put down and keep operating your company? Um, and this is especially for companies whose core business is not fundamentally misaligned with climate change. Mm -hmm. So where are you banking? Does your bank loan to fossil fuel companies? Um, we work with a lot of startups that say, how, how can I find the right place to do that? Mm -hmm. How are you investing your employees and your, if you're contributing, 401k dollars? We help with that at Carbon Collective. We have a lot of mission-driven startups and companies that come to work with us because we can help them get plans that align with their mission and don't contradict it. Um, those are those basis. There's also a lot more really cool carbon accounting tools that again, it's that similar thing of you pick it up, you connect it with all of your bank and things like that, and then you get to operate within it. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's an added system, but you're not, you know, always in this state of trying to be in decision fatigue. And that's such a problem in this space mm. is one of decision fatigue. So something that I'm imagining, and maybe someone will do this in the world, maybe it'll be us, is that we should have for companies, it should be a quarter long project, which are, here are all the things, it's called sustainability quarter. Here are all the things to pick up 
or we're going to achieve this quarter. And when you do so, you're going to be at a markedly different place as a company from a sustainability perspective. And then once you do that, you can start looking at, all right, what are the products that I'm building? How can we make that as aligned with climate change and as sustainable as possible? So you'll have this great foundation of all the back end and kind of the gears of how the company is operating during that. And then you get to focus on, all right, what is now specific to my company itself? And how do I do that? Um, and I think there's a lot of advantages. Having you know renewable energy plus a battery backup power your company. We're seeing electricity prices spike right now. And there's, you know, here in California, there's more times when the electricity gets shut off. Um, that is actually, there's a multiple effect of there of that's actually protecting your company against sudden uh, pr uh, price hikes in electricity mm -hmm. and against power outages. There are just advantages to that. That is both climate mitigation and adaptation. So I think there's going to be more and more of that to come. Oh my goodness, I hope you're correct. <laughs> I mean, and, it, and, and you know, when you think about it that way, it only makes sense. It makes a lot of sense to go if you're using renewable resources like wind, like water to to get your power. Wind isn't going anywhere right now. So that's a really good thing. And yet our, our the non renewable resources, they're not resources. They're going away and more more quickly than slowly. So I think that's wonderful. And and something you said very early on in our chat an individual person can be the spark that lights that particular flame. The individual person working in a company could start raising that awareness, could start going, hey, what if we did this? And it could come from the top down, but it could also come from the bottom up. I think we have more power here than we think we do. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Look at the great resignation right now. Uh, employees have a huge amount of power in what they do. Um, and so it is, uh, it, it, and again, it, it comes to that fact of how, ask yourself, how does the world change? And when that time is right, and, and it's, you know, for people like Carbon Collective and things like that, of how do we make it as easy as possible mm -hmm. for you to recommend the right solution? So you're not left saying, oh man, I know my company isn't sustainable. I need to figure out how it could be sustainable. What are the best resources for it to be sustainable that aren't greenwashed? And who do I talk to at my company? And how do I prepare for all of their hard questions? Uh, the more that we could help you just be like, all I need to do is know the right person out of my company to talk to, and that's it. That's going to set you up for the most success. So I know there's a lot more resources like that that are available today. And I believe over the next few years, it's just, we're going to see an explosion. Ah, oh, that I love them. it. That's terrific. I Speaking of contacting the Carbon Collective, what a beautiful segue you gave me there, Zach. Can you tell me if somebody's going, I want to know more about this, where do they find you? Do, give me your website, your social media. I'm going to put it all that in the sh show notes because I think people learn differently. But I'd love it if you would just say where someone who's looking to find out more information could get a hold of you. Absolutely. We're at carboncollective.co, so .co. Um, and if you have any questions, there's a button called talk to a human. We are real people <laughs> who I hope you can tell care about this as much as you do um, and study it really closely. So any questions you have, it is so worth it to us to talk to you and be there live to help you on this journey, whether it is with Carbon Collective or not. We just need as many people investing sustainably as possible, because, again, we cannot solve climate change without changing how we invest. Absolutely. And and I love that you said it that way. We 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 have a lot more power than we think we do. You, if you're listening to this, you have more power than you think you do. And Carbon Collective, and I feel like I'm 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 like an ad for you. Carbon Collective has all your investment <laughs> needs met. Uh, you know, but but at the same time, I think I think it's so important for us to realize that we have power in the way we invest our dollars. We we just do. And so knowing and becoming aware of the best way to mitigate this this catastrophe that we're sort of careening towards uh is a really good way to do that so i'm so grateful that you took the time to be here on the show zach and talk about this and we're going to be back if you if you if you are if you're a part of the member of the bonus crowd we're going to have a bonus episode uh, a mini episode with zach and just you can find it in the show notes if you want but i would love to ask you one last question before i let you go for this episode zach if that's okay 
Go for it, Isolde. Cool. And this is a question that I ask everybody who comes on the show, and it's a weird little question, but I find it can yield some profound answers. And the question is this. If you had a carbon neutral airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Wow. What a question. I had like a bunch of really hippie answers kept in my mind. <laughs> like, you know, we are one and love and stuff like that. Um, Those are good answers. <laughs> build, build the future you want to live in. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's fabulous. Build the future you want to live in. And it would fit and the skywriting thing. So that's perfect. Zach, once again, I'm just barely. <laughs> They'd have to be down at the horizon looking for those last couple of words. <laughs> I'm so grateful you took the time to be here. I'm really and you're doing incredible work because this this notion of of sustainable investment of being able to invest with with that as the forefront is I think it's crucial. I think it's necessary. So I'm really grateful that you're doing this and that you took the time to be on the podcast to talk about it was so honored to be here would love to come back anytime you want to talk about it more oh i uh, yes please that'd be great this is as old attractionberg for the innovative mindset podcast i hope you've enjoyed the episode as always i remind you that if you are a member of the uh ocean coffee club you know what to do to get to the bonus episode that zach and i are about to record for you and all the other bonus episodes and also i remind you as always to be bold be creative and most of all be kind <music>